everyone. Welcome to Working Together, where we discuss changes to the work environment and the economy. I'm your host, Cheryl Crozier Garcia, inviting you to join in the conversation. You could call area code 415-871-2474 to speak with us live in the studio, or you can tweet us at at ThinkTechHI. On our last show, we discussed the changing work environment for knowledge workers. Specifically, we spoke with a college professor who was now a member of the gig economy and learning his livelihood teaching one course at a time for a number of universities. Today we'll be talking about another profession that has undergone significant changes in the last few years, the news industry. Broadcast and print journalism have changed radically over the last few years and these changes have had a tremendous effect on media workers at all levels. Joining us today live via Skype from WIOZ Radio in Southern Pines, North Carolina, is Steve Biddle. Steve is a longtime on-air radio personality with a very interesting story to tell about his experiences with the changing media industry. Hi, Steve. Hi, Cheryl. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I understand it's late at night in North Carolina now. Well, it's 9 o'clock. <laughs> but that's okay. It's not, not terribly late, but okay. uh, it's significantly later than it is in Honolulu. Mm. Well, I'm glad you could take the time to be with us. My uh, pleasure. You actually, before you get into your story of um, the impact the gig economy has had on you uh, mm -hmm. professionally and personally, could you tell us about your Hawaii connection? Sure. Um, I worked uh, for KIKI Radio from 1978 to 79, and then later on I went across the street and worked for what was um, KDUK, Cape Boy FM, mm -hmm. and worked there for a year. So I lived in Honolulu for two years from 1978 to 1980, and uh, have uh, regretted leaving ever since. So I oh. just had a wonderful time there. But yeah, it was, uh, it was a good time. I still have contact, as you know, with a lot of people in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. uh, at KIKI, I was, I was known for a reason, because there's a story behind this, I was known as Rusty Crane. Okay. And, uh, and then I switched back to my real name when I went across the street to mm -hmm. Cape Boy FM. Mm -hmm. Why did they uh, call you Rusty Crane? <laughs> well, for some reason, they didn't like my name. And um, the station was owned by a man named Jim Gabbard at the time, who was uh, based in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember whether it was he that decided this or one of the, or the general manager, but we were sitting in the office one day and deciding we had to come up with a new name. And at that time, I had red sideburns. Mm -hmm. And they said, huh? Rusty. How about a name Rusty? I said, okay, I said, Rusty works. And then there was a building going up across the street, and a crane was sticking out of the top of it. So, <laughs> I know, Rusty Crane. So that's how I became Rusty Crane. Well. For a year. Many people still know you as Rusty around here. That's true. Um, so you left Hawaii, and you got into uh, more career opportunities in, in uh, broadcast media. Right. But in the last few years, there have been some fairly significant changes. Tell us about those and about how they affected you. Well, in my life, I went to work uh, eventually in public radio mm -hmm. at uh, WPSU at Penn State University. And to be honest with you, frankly, my heart just wasn't in public radio. I, I, I did it well. I can do the NPR style and everything, but it was, uh, I guess my heart just wasn't in it. And I didn't have any luck getting back into commercial radio for a while because the radio industry had changed significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, for, no, for a number of reasons, which we can get into later, but it had changed so much, it was very difficult to find a job. And to make a long story short, we can go into as much detail as you want. I, I wound up doing a number of other things. For a while, while I was still part-time in radio, I became a certified hypnotherapist. Um, I drove a taxi later on. I drove for Uber a year or so ago, and I had one job where I was driving school buses across the United States from the manufacturer in High Point, North Carolina, mm -hmm. to the Pacific Northwest every week. So, and it was just very difficult to, to find a job in radio. Mm -hmm. One of the things I had done for years on the side was to do radio production, write and produce radio commercials, do voiceovers, narration, things like that. And when the price came down on equipment, when everything went digital, mm -hmm. all of a sudden everybody had a home studio. So there was a lot more competition out there and the, the, the pie was divided into a lot smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. So it has been a rough, a rough time for the past, uh, oh, probably seven to eight years. Uh, 
And then I went through, I went through a divorce and everything, which also doesn't make things any easier. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a uh, radio industry has changed significantly for two major reasons. Uh, one of them is computer automation. Mm -hmm. And one of them is regulations, which now allow large companies to buy pretty much as many radio stations and TV stations in one market as they want to, which has allowed for the prol proliferation of companies like Clear Channel, Cumulus, mm -hmm. And those companies, which will just buy up everything, fire half the staff, and they don't... As local broadcasters, we always felt a mission to serve the community. Right. Become involved in the community, to go out and do things in the community, and to program to the people that we were supposed to program to. Mm -hmm. But the large companies have cut out a lot of that now, and you can hear go across the country, and radio sounds the same pretty much everywhere you go, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. Same rotation. Mm -hmm. and, Every and 12 songs is the same one and they start all over again and, and frequently the same people because yes that's some, true the, syndicated shows are kind of a huge deal yeah pardon me uh syndicated shows yeah and oh. and and what they call voice tracking mm -hmm. uh, i could i could sit here in my home studio and voice track a show on a radio station in los angeles and it would sound like i was there and this is what a lot of stations do now uh -huh. uh, and they even do that for local newscasts um I worked at, a, at, a, at one point part-time for a company called Virtual News Center mm -hmm. and supplied newscasts, local newscasts, to radio stations around the country. And at one point, during the long, sad story, I was living, while well, I was, had a job in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. I was living in a windowless room in a comfort inn in Greencastle, Pennsylvania, and doing local news for a radio station in Anchorage. And People who would listen would think I was right there in Anchorage, but no, I was in a motel room in Chambersburg, Greencastle, Pennsylvania. And this is very common in radio now. Mm -hmm. Which would be worse, do you think? Being in a one-room, windowless comfort inn in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, or being in Anchorage, Alaska? I mean, which? <laughs> I, I guess it, each has its pros and cons, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably the, at that point in my life, being in the windowless room in Greencastle was worse. Yeah. I think uh, being in, in Anchorage would have been at least more of an adventure. So you've had to really um, reinvent yourself sort of a number of times, not only in terms of your broadcast career and having to be willing to change formats uh, mm -hmm. across different stations throughout your career, but you've also had to reinvent yourself uh, really across professions, right? Because uh, you had to become... Uh, in order to drive school buses across the country, you had to earn the appropriate licenses. Right, a CDL, commercial okay. driver's license. Type A, type B? Uh, I had a type B. Oh, fantastic. There's work here. If you ever decide, um, I can hook you up as a matter of fact. All right. With, I'd love to come back. Yeah. You want to you want to drive trucks in Honolulu? Oh, we got oh, work. A, I, have a, I, have a, I have a class B. That's I can't drive the big rigs. Oh, um, Okay. Yeah, I can drive. I can drive school buses and well, any buses actually. Um, so if there's buses to drive, I'd love to do that. We can. I'll I'll send you the link. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So, um, how when you were going about this process of discerning how you were going to reinvent yourself, what sorts of things did you think about? Because I know at one time uh, you had mentioned that your financial situation had become so challenging. Well, I don't want to tell. You tell how challenging yeah, it became. It, um, it still is. It still is. It still is? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so tell us about that, and tell us how you decided that it was bus driving and Uber um, that would replace, say, production work or the other types of broadcast work that you had been doing. Well, some of it was not so much reinvention as it was being in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, I wound up in High Point, North Carolina back in 2011. Um, I, I had a, my breakup with Penn State was, they, I lost my job there. A number of us lost our jobs at the same time when there was mm -hmm. a funding cut. Mm -hmm. And I found myself sort of out in the cold. And I went back to Orlando for a while. Um, I think, okay, well, this is where I grew up. I'll, I'll just be here. I'd gone through a divorce. And uh, I, I wound up in Orlando for a while where I worked in public radio on what was under... And even at the beginning, it was understood to have been a temporary thing, hosting All Things Considered in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then went back to uh, North Carolina. My mom was in hospice at the time. 
And so I decided to stay there in North Carolina and, and, until she passed. Mm -hmm. And then I was offered a job which paid very, very little anchoring news for a chain of six radio stations in Southern Illinois. And I went out there for a little while. In the meantime, I got married again. And I uh, had some heart problems and wound up back in High Point. I had no health insurance because I couldn't afford the, the company's health insurance. Uh, the pay was abysmally low, mm -hmm. and, but it was a job, and you kind of grab onto anything at that point. So I, uh, I went back to High Point, North Carolina, where my sister lived and my mom and dad were, and my wife and I stayed there for a number of years. And I, I met somebody one day at church who suggested that I uh, get a CDL, and he knew somebody that was a school bus instructor. Mm -hmm. So I went up and uh, took took the school bus driving classes and got my CDL and started driving actual children <laughs> for a while, middle school kids. Uh-huh. And oh, did that. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Ooh. Oh, the stories I've got. I bet you have. But um, uh, Thomas-built school buses are manufactured in High Point. Mm hmm And they have companies called drive-away companies mm -hmm. that I went to work for one or two of those at the same time and would take the buses from the manufacturer in High Point out to the dealerships, the bus dealerships, primarily in Seattle and Portland, mm -hmm. with occasional trips to Oklahoma City and Houston. But primarily Seattle and Portland to the point where it was uh, every week I would, I would leave High Point, usually on a Sunday morning or a Monday morning, mm -hmm. drive up through Tennessee, uh, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, and points west until I would get to either Seattle or Portland, mm -hmm. drop off the bus, get on a plane, fly back, pick up another bus, and do my laundry, and pick up another bus the next day, and then drive out again, over mm -hmm. and over and over again. And it was okay for a while, but after a while, you don't even know what day it is. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that came to a halt, because I wanted to go back to State College, Pennsylvania. I'd started considering that home. Mm -hmm. So I went back there a year ago, and I had been doing freelance copywriting and commercial work in my studio for this company, Muirfield Broadcasting, here in Southern Pines. Mm -hmm. And I really had come to like them very much. And I had visited here once or twice just to see the folks that I'd been working with. And back in January or February of last year, one of my friends here said, hey, you know, we've got a rare opening uh, doing the morning show if you'd like to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's on AM. And the guy that left was 70-something years old, and he... Uh, he was decided to retire, and it's an, what they call an adult standards program, mm -hmm. which is Frank Sinatra, Perry Como, the stuff I, I started playing when I first started in radio in Orlando in 1972. So it's kind of old home week, but uh, it's part-time. Well, that's nice. Listen, Rusty, we need to go to break uh, okay. so that we can let our viewers see some of the other fantastic programming we have here on Think Tech Hawaii. But hang around, because I want to talk more about the radio industry. Can you do Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Awesome. We'll be back in two minutes. This is Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. Okay, I'm here with Brent Obergaard of the Faculty of the School of Journalism in the Department of Communications at UH Manoa. We've had a number of shows. We have a movable feast going on, and we talk about journalism, we talk about language, we talk about communication in general, and we talk about the effect of that on the country and on individual people. Brent, it's so good to, to be able to discuss this with you in our movable feast. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is a great opportunity. You'll have to come back again and again, okay, deal? Uh, that's the deal. Brent Opergaard, <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel. We care about everything, thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marianne Sasaki, and I'm here today to tell you about the Women's March on Washington on January 21st. It's an incredibly significant march in which all, both men and women are going to stand up for women's rights, w women's reproductive rights, and all the rights we've accrued over the past 40 or 50 years. There's also going to be marches in each city, uh, on each island. There's one in Oahu. I urge you to join a march and stand up for women's rights. Welcome back. This is Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Cheryl Crozier Garcia. And joining us live via Skype from WIOZ Radio in North Carolina is longtime radio personality and former Hawaii DJ, Steve Biddle. Hi, Steve. Hi, Cheryl. Uh, Great to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, you had mentioned uh, before the break some of the personal uh, issues that you experienced. Um, so what I'd kind of like to do now for the second half of the show is pull back and look at the changes in media kind of from a broader sort of 
macroeconomic perspective. And okay. it, it seems to me, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, there, uh, that the balkanization of the media has not been universally a good thing. I mean, on the one hand, without this balkanization, you and I would not be doing this at this very moment. True. Um, so it has permitted people uh, greater access to media than ever before. But it's also allowed the profitization of uh, particularly news. So we don't have specific news anymore. Now it's more sort of infotainment. Right. Uh, and there's a real focus on uh, really appealing to the extremely small uh, niche markets that have a, seem to have a, a particular political stance or a particular um, uh, way of viewing the world where people are not necessarily interested in learning about the other. They're more interested about in shutting out the other and maintaining life in whatever bubble they're living in. Um, can you tell us about your experience with that? Well, I, my, my experience has really been more of an old radio guy who watches everything slipping away. Uh, I mean, the same thing has happened with newspapers. When mm -hmm. people have changed their sources of news, um, and newspapers find themselves dying uh, everywhere. Uh, and this is the same is true of radio, particularly AM radio. Mm -hmm. uh, because now there are, so, and, well, when we talked earlier about corporations taking over radio stations by the hundreds, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things they did was they slashed local news coverage, they slashed people being at the radio station 24-7. Now, I, I, I'm assuming a lot of folks know about this, but when you listen to the radio, if you listen any time after 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, chances are there's nobody actually on the air. It's a computer running the whole thing, and they're voice tracking. They're, mm -hmm. they're just recording voice tracks that go in, and the computer sticks them in where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And there may be no one there, except in the sales office. That's true. Uh, and and that's, that's a shame, because what people used to do would be to, if something was going on in town, you put the radio on because you knew that somebody there would know what was happening. Mm -hmm. That's what the emergency now. broadcast system was built on, isn't it? Exactly. Doesn't it say in the little blurb, uh, when you hear the siren, turn on your radio for additional news and information. Sure, um, absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mention that because we have had, in the last couple of years, we've had horrific storms, traffic, um, power outages, tsunami warnings, etc. And I don't know if you remember Perry and Price. No, I don't uh, think so. Okay, Michael W. Perry and Larry Price. Oh, Michael W. Perry, I remember, Those folks. yes. Right, so uh, they are still on KSSK. Um, and they're the only ones that, are, that can go live uh, in their st station. So whenever there's an emergency, we kind of, we tune in to what we now call, among my friends and family, the Perry and Price Parade of Pain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because people call in and they say things like, um, uh, I can't get my car out of the parking lot and I need to evacuate. Is somebody driving past Kukui Street and can you give me a lift? I mean, it's, yeah. it's those kinds of things. And it's good that people are able to access assistance by using broadcast media. But the reality is, what would happen if Perry and Price couldn't get to the studio? And there was and nobody what, and nothing but dead air. And people rely on social media now more for things like that, Facebook and Twitter and everything mm -hmm. else. But again, it's one of those things where the, the juxtaposition of corporate takeovers of, of many, many stations and this ability to do everything via computer and the internet hit at the same time, mm -hmm. approximately. Mm -hmm. So when radio companies like, well, like Cumulus and Clear Channel and the other big ones saw the opportunity, they said, okay, radio stations are now just profit centers. That's, that's it, bottom line. Mm -hmm. And took the, the essence of radio away. And so that's, that's what has happened to it. And at the same time, people had the, the ability to tune in satellite radio, they had the ability to carry 10,000 songs in their pocket now, which we never did. I remember the first Walkman I ever saw was a cassette, and it was Larry Bertelman that had it in Honolulu. <laughs> and we all said, oh, it's incredible. He, he used to do the, he, when I was on uh, KDUK. K4 I FM, remember. He did, did the, he did the surf report on my show, and he came mm -hmm. and said, you got to see this. <laughs> it was a Walkman, was, right? A Sony Walkman? It, it was a Sony Walkman. There you but go. But now you can put 10,000 songs on your phone 
and carry it around in your pocket. That's true. But even years ago, they should have known because every survey, every listener survey said, why do you listen to the radio? The overwhelming response was for companionship. Mm -hmm. I mean, people would say music, sure, but they, they listen to disc jockeys, they listen to news, they listen to what was going on in the community. It was somebody there. And that yeah. feeling's gone. Yeah. It, well, I guess Delilah is still yeah. she, on the air still live. There. She's still out there, yeah. Yeah, she is. Um, one of the things that has changed that has really sort of uh, caught me unawares is the idea that, uh, particularly as we, become, as we are consumers of news and of news information, that we are no longer able to look at just, say, one station or one newscast or one newspaper to get a balanced view of what is really happening in the world. I mean, well, the, the days of Walter Cronkite and Bob Seavey are gone. Yeah. There's just nobody, I, there's nobody I trust anyway for yeah. the complete news package. Well, and, and the, you just hit, the, hit it using the word consumer. That's how news companies now view us is as consumers, mm -hmm. not as people who need to be informed and, and, well, not so much entertained, but informed and kept enlightened. Mm -hmm. I, I, if, you, if you watch television news now, there's a lot more junk than there used to be on it. Uh, I, I'm surprised here in North Carolina, we have a TV station in the state capital in Raleigh, which is really excellent. They do a terrific job, and I feel... This is rare. You don't see it very often. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the thing that really, that really gets me, and we talked about this one time earlier, is that news has become more of a profit center than anything else. They've, right. they've made that into a profit center. And uh, it used to be, when I first got into the business, that radio news was sort of sacred. You didn't touch it. It was objective. We, we were very proud of being objective. Um, and it was what you listened to. It's mm -hmm. where you got your information and you could trust it. Mm -hmm. And it just no longer is that way. And there are so many outlets, so many places that can, people can get their information from. Well, look at fake news, what we've been hearing so much about recently, fake news. Sure. Uh, I, I battle it every day. I, I'm one of those people that when I see fake news pop up on, on somebody's Facebook page, I ferret the stuff out and I say, no, this is fake. You should mm -hmm. look these things up because it ir irritates me. <laughs> but uh, it's, it, though it's changed a great deal, as we said before, uh, there's a, there are several companies uh, which provide local news for radio stations that they're not anywhere near. And I know there's, there's one in Honolulu that does that. Yeah, I, I know of a couple. How do, um, well, let's shift then, and we're going to now use your expertise to uh, educate consumers of news product um, in order to pick and choose and get the most reliable news coverage. What would you recommend that consumers look for uh, in their news media to make sure that they're getting as objective a view as possible of the various industries? That's sort of a tough one because I don't really know anymore. Uh, what I try to do is to, to take a look at things that even try to get out of my bubble because we all have them mm -hmm. and read things from sources all over the place. Mm -hmm. One, one thing I would like to make people aware of, though, is, is to watch out for the fake news. It's pervasive, and it spreads like a, well, it goes viral, as they say. Mm -hmm. And the thing to do is if you see a, a news story that sounds somewhat incredible and you feel tempted to post it again, mm -hmm. look and see if it's coming from other sources as well. Look at the source. For instance, there's a, there's a site called abcnews.com.co or something, which has nothing to do with ABC News, mm -hmm. but they have a logo that looks sort of like the ABC logo. And it's fake. It's just lies, oh. uh, or what they think of as satire. Uh -huh. um, but but if I, go to the mainstream media and and down from there. I mean, sure, look at things like uh, uh, Politico, Vox, mm -hmm. uh, The Hill, um, National Review on the conservative side, and uh, New Republic on the on the liberal side. And tr if you have the time, try to just absorb everything that you read from all of them, mm -hmm. because really, any more that's that's. The only way to do it is to read a variety of things, listen to a variety of things. Yeah. You're right, you know, because um, I I'm glad you mentioned both the liberal and the conservative, because the other aspect I think that people may find challenging is that, uh, b number one, broadcast folks 
tend to take only one view. Uh, mm. There are very conservative uh, providers of news information, say Fox or other periodicals. And then there's the uh, more liberal view from, say, MSNBC. Yeah, MSNBC or maybe some of those others. Um, and, and you know what each of those talking heads, what their political stance is, simply right. by where they work and the issues that they talk about. Yep, um, it's, and that seems new to me because, well, we never knew who Walter Cronkite voted for or True. which candidate Bob Seavey supported or any of the other radio folks back in the day. If, if we knew who they were supporting, they weren't doing their jobs right. And True. instead now it's, you know, we need to heat up the base so that these folks will be mobilized to want to leave that channel right where it is and you know so so that we can sell uh laundry soap and toothpaste well and not only that but people now at least up until a few years ago it seems to me that news outlets were at least pretending objectivity mm -hmm. and more and more they're they're just letting that fall by the wayside and going into to advocacy journalism one way or the other um and there are those that say that's healthy. I mean, that's the way newspapers used to be 100 years ago. You know, there would be a newspaper that was on the Democratic side, one that was on the Republican side, and they were very unabashed about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how I feel about that because anymore, again, and especially since, uh, since Trump was elected, I've noticed this, people are, are just abandoning all, all pretense of objectivity. Yeah, so it's true. really, there's a lot of buyer beware out there. You're right. You know, Steve, our time is rapidly coming to a close. Um, and I think 9.30 is right around the time the pubs open in, in North Carolina. So we, it's right around the time I go to sleep. Oh, okay. What? <laughs> no. So uh, we thank you for joining us. You've given us a lot of good information about how to really be smart consumers of news information. And you've helped to sort of erase many of the misconceptions that we have about folks in broadcasting. So thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right, you take care. You too. So that wraps us up for today. Uh, I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, thanking you for joining us on Working Together uh, at Think Tech Hawaii. We will see you in two weeks. Aloha. Okay, Rusty, I owe you big, man. Oh no, this is fun, Cheryl, I loved it. <laughs> this is great. I hope it was okay. <laughs> <laughs>